Good evening. I welcome you on behalf of Countryside Community United Church of Christ and those we partnered with to uh, bring Dr. Uh, James Forbes here this evening. Uh, also, uh, there's actually more than just us uh, here, just us, uh, there's, uh, but uh, we're also uh, streaming out over the internet at, at this very moment, so we're, uh, we actually have the world community uh, joining us for our event uh, this evening. Uh, just if you're new here for the first time, we want to especially uh, welcome you and thank you for uh, coming. Uh, and j just to kind of give you a little heads up about the layout of this place, uh, one of the most critical places to know about um, is out and directly to the left. That's where the restrooms are. You'll find there the signs. Uh, af af and then after uh, we finish, we'll, we invite you to uh, coffee and, uh, and some goodies right immediately in our, our foyer area. Well, this has been, um, oh, and one other piece of, of very important uh, uh, thing is if you have one of these, if you'll turn that to off or stun, that would be very much appreciated uh, by our, our speaker and uh, everyone around you. Um, so this has just been a really incredibly full day here at Countryside Church. I started at 9 o'clock in the morning with Dr. Forbes. Uh, a preaching, and it was just amazing. And, I kept thinking, and this is only going to get better. He, we hear him again. And it was just, it was, a, it was like the same sermon, but completely different. And it was like, this is amazing. And then it's like, and it's only going to get better. He's going to preach, he's going to talk again at Darkwood Brew. And he did. And it was like, and this is amazing. And, and then we get this. <laughs> it's like, yay. So we're really excited. It's been and delighted to, that uh, he would take time out of an extremely busy uh, travel schedule. Uh, uh, to be here, and uh, but I'm not going to spend any more. Uh, we want to hear him, so we want to first uh, bring up uh, Cindy Kugler to make an introduction, and also note our our partners for the evening. On behalf of the Center for Faith Studies here at Countryside Church, I'm going to chime in right where Eric left off, welcoming all of you to this very special event. As many of you may know, we sponsor an annual lecture series, which you can learn more about in this pamphlet. And if you would like one of the pamphlets, they're on the table by the windows as you exit today. This gives a list of uh, lecture events for which we gather together regularly as a community to hear various presenters exploring topics that meet at the intersections of faith and culture. Our brochure gives you an overview of our speakers in this year's series. However, this happens every year. As the year progresses, we often find reason to add additional speakers. And Dr. James A. Forbes, Jr. is a wonderful example of an added opportunity for all of us. Please join me in welcoming him, first of all. <laughs> Many of you were here for one or more worship services today with Dr. Forbes, and yet you perhaps are, even so, sitting by people that you haven't met yet. Part of the purpose for these Center for Faith Studies events is to draw together the greater community, closer to each other, and to offer good Midwestern hospitality. So if you are watching via the internet right now, please know that we greet you and welcome you to Omaha, invite you to Omaha anytime you want to come join us in person. And we also, for those of you in the room right now, those who are able, please stand and introduce yourself to the people that are right around you, just for a minute. Thank you. <laughs> I invite you, I invite you to continue these conversations. <laughs> Wow, that's like opening a can of worms. <laughs> Coffee and cookies will enhance your further conversation later. Since 2004, 
we have sponsored the Center for Faith Studies Lecture Series. We continue to do so because the response has been so positive and heartwarming, and the possible topics are endless, and the expressions of appreciation are significant. Dr. Forbes preached this morning about how to put our fractured America back together again. And within that sermon, he talked about this need for strong community, a regard for each other, and our work for the common good. I find within our own community, indeed, a great interest in the Center for Faith Studies and secular organizations as well as faith groups that are eager to work together on particular projects and topics. Tonight, I would like to give special thanks for our co-sponsors who supported the idea and the event this evening. First Central Congregational United Church of Christ, the Heartland Clergy for Inclusion, PFLAG Omaha, Inclusive Communities, Darkwood Brew, and Countryside Community Church. Please help me thank them. Instead of offering tickets this evening, we have included a contribution envelope in your program. And we will have ushers available to collect any donations as you leave the sanctuary later. We sincerely thank you for your support as we continue our mission of offering these community events. I was privileged to hear Dr. Forbes preach at Riverside Church in New York City some 10 or so years ago. It was an amazing experience. His wisdom was impressed on my mind, and his charm and ability to communicate impressed on my heart. Since then, of course, I've learned much more about him, followed his remarkable career, which you can read about in your program, and I've kept a file labeled James Forbes, right front and center on my desk, looking forward to this day when he would come to leave new and important wisdom with our community. Please help me welcome Dr. James Forbes. Thank you, um, both Cindy and Eric, for the roles you have played in helping to bring me to this beautiful community, countryside, but also colleagues from other congregations. And it's just uh, been a wonderful day. I feel renewed uh, as a result of all of the exchanges I've had from the morning service. So I'm not extinguished yet. So. <laughs> Uh, ready to share. It's a beautiful gathering tonight, and I feel a sense of, well, my assumption is that you, you know what we're going to talk about. You know that the intent is to promote the radical inclusiveness of all of God's brothers and sisters beyond consideration of their race, creed, color, previous condition of servitude, or even sexual orientation, and yet you are here. And I hope that I will be able to make a contribution to the venturing into the full family of God so that it includes all of us. Before I get started tonight, I'd like to do a shout out to glory, reflecting that my life and my understanding have been impacted by others. And two of the persons who I think maybe have wrestled with me as I've tried to grow into a more mature perspective on sexuality, especially inclusiveness, the radical affirming and affirmation. And I think maybe both of them have gone on to glory, but they have certainly left evidences of their scholarship and their deep commitment. The first is Peter Gomes. I just found out that it was a a couple of years, February uh, of 2011, when he passed at the Memorial Church at Harvard. But the book called The Good Book, uh, Reading the Bible with Mind and Heart. In it, he has one of the best descriptions of what we need to think about in regards to some of the tough texts which we have that relate to uh, inclusiveness of gay and lesbian and transgendered and bisexual, etc., 
but he really takes time out to help us. And he has a chapter in which he goes through all of the tough verses in relationship to the Bible and homosexuality, the last prejudice, chapter 8. And, uh, oh, Peter Gomes, oh, what a magisterial person, black man who was proud that his family came over on the Mayflower. And, uh, but uh, he was a wonderful author. And uh, the good book, I recommend. Hope you're doing good, Peter. All right. Also, Walter Wink, who just a year ago uh, was a wonderful leader, Bible study uh, guy, theologian. His latest book before he passed had to do with humanity, the human one. Uh, it's so far out that even I'm trying to read to catch up with what he's trying to say. But he also did publish a book entitled Homosexuality and Christian Faith. Uh, it's edited by him, and he gathered a, a group of outstanding scholars, and he asked me to write the introduction to this volume. So uh, Walter Wink has some very helpful insights in this book. This is really not to promote them. They won't get any royalties up there. But, <laughs> but it's just to say, if you really want a good resource, uh, my two friends uh, are, 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 I think, worth uh, paying a little attention to. Now, having said that, let me uh, get down to business with respect to what I want to talk about tonight. Um, I'd like, before I talk to you, to ask you to join me in the spirit of gratitude for the gift of life. And as I talk with you and those who will be viewing uh, from points north, east, and west, and south from here, um, I want to say it's a better conversation, no matter how controversial it is. If we could take time to be grateful for the gift of life. Gratitude is the best way to begin a conversation that may even be difficult to bridge the gaps in understanding. So if you don't mind, I want you to sing with me a song. And it's an easy song. It's a chorus I use before workshops when I work with preachers. And it goes like, oh Lord, we love you. We worship and adore you. Glorify your name in all the earth. Glorify your name. Glorify your name. Glorify your name in all the earth. So now that's not too hard to learn. It's, oh Lord, we love you. We worship and adore you. Glorify your name in all the earth. Glorify your name. Glorify your name. Glorify your name in all the earth. Would you have courage enough to venture that with me? Oh, Lord, we love you. We worship and adore you. Glorify your name in all the earth. Glorify your name. Glorify your name, glorify your name in all the earth. Now, if you were in my homiletical workshop, I'd take you one step further. And I don't think I'm going to do that. But what I would ask you to do is to recognize that when you really have a sense of gratitude, your body has a problem because only the mouth gets a chance to participate. And so what I would do, I'm not going to do it tonight. Be, be, uh, I would normally ask you to uh, sing it again, but let the body participate. So I would wish you to learn how to choreograph your gratitude to God. Let me say, oh Lord, we love you, we worship and adore you. Glorify your name, or however you, however you, all the earth. Glorify your name, glorify your name, glorify your name in all the earth. I do a little period like that. So basically, when we say we are grateful, it's important that we allow the body to participate in it. 
Whatever is deeply moving and meaningful requires embodiment. For we may be spirits made in God's image, but we're in a body. We cannot ignore or make tangential body, its shape, its size, its impulses, its fantasies, its longings, its desires. You've got to give room for the body. And your body is different than my body. And I, I want my body to be affirmed. I want to praise God with all that I am. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, and all that is within me. Wow. Let me, that could be heretical. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, and all that is within me. Bless God's holy name. What about, what about the sexual part of me? Of course, if my particular configuration has not received the good housekeeping seal <laughs> of the community, that could make that verse difficult to say. Because if there are aspects of who I am that are not granted permission to enter into the presence of God, to give gratitude, then it could be transgressive for me if I'm differently configured than has been prescribed. That could make it difficult for me to say, bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me, bless God's holy name. Well, I guess this is just setting the tone for what I want to talk about tonight. Because I guess, I, well, no, I don't guess. I'm clear now that I would wish that all God's children, uh, whatever their color, their race, their class, even their ideology, even folks that don't even agree with me, because I think that if we bless God with all that we are, it's like receiving a cookie from my grandbaby that she has dropped on the floor. <laughs> and if I take the cookie, if she wants me to eat it, Sometimes I may have to brush it off, which is my way of saying, if we permitted each other to offer all that we are and all that we have, if God sees anything on it that isn't exactly, you know, receivable in the form, God works with that, which raises the question, uh, a baby who drops a pacifier on the ground. Are you, are you a mother? No, but I have a 10-year-old brother, so I know. Do you go to, and do you sterilize the thing before you put it back in the mouth and shut them up? Mm -hmm. There are those who suggest that capacity for life carries with it the discernment that people who are too antiseptic actually destroy the longevity of life itself. I just want to get to, like, do, do you understand how my mind's working? Because then there's some folks that say, oh, are you saying that I am dirt that needs to be wiped off? But speaking of cookies, all of this is speaking of cookies. At Riverside Church, I preached one of my first sermons on inclusiveness, and I asked uh, Miedema. Y'all know Miedema? The singer, blind singer, who plays Ken Miedemann, to, uh, to be there. So I preached 
and his job was to compose a song after I got through preaching. But I was preaching on the fact that, that in terms of race, we used to think that black people were made by God just like other folks. And that God had made us like in a bakery and had put all of the cookies into the oven. And the reason we turned out black was the Lord left us in the oven too, sir, too long. Or the reason that some of y'all are white is the Lord took cookies out the oven too quickly. <laughs> but anyway, I prayed this. I said, so, so does God claim that that he made these black cookies, or did he make only vanilla cookies? And I talked about it. And I said, now, even in sexuality, does God, does God say, I only, out of my creativity, I only made folks that were, that were heterosexual in their orientation? Or does God say, I had only one kind of human being in mind. And anything that is not the one thing I had in mind is the degenerative form of being. Uh, and I said, um, uh, is it that if we really could have an interview with God and say, Lord, we observe in the cosmos infinite variety of stars and asteroids and galaxies, and etc. And in the plant world, we see, oh, we cannot even categorize all of these forms. With respect to humankind, we observe extraordinary similarity by virtue of DNA, but we experience that with some minor variations, there's all sorts of difference. Are you more happy when we claim that you made only this kind, or did you make this kind and that kind, and which way? I mean, in regards to these cookies, I said, did you only make straight cookies, or did you make gay cookies? <laughs> so at the end of the uh, end of my sermon, oh, Ken, me and McGowan family in Riverside Church. And he said, dun, 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 dun. yo mama, what you making in there? I love that. <laughs> yo mama. Yo mama, what you making in there? Because I think no matter what I say tonight, the most, the most crucial consideration as we have our conversation with God is God, did you make people of different orientations in so far as the evolutionary process has your handprint on it anyway? Or are you claiming that they are all my children and that I love them all the same and that I do not consider this child the norm by which I marriage to the other, but that I establish the norm by the completeness of my family and all of my children are my children don't be me messing with any of them That's because they are different from you. All that I'm saying now is just preliminary to what I'm getting ready to say, except that it just sets the tone so the people out there listening can understand. Well, which way is he headed? Well, I've already told you where I'm headed. <laughs> I, I, I have headed. I have headed towards God being much more infinitely inclusive than we could ever imagine and that we have to do our best to work it out. Now then, I'm ready to begin my lecture. <laughs> no, I've already started my lecture. I asked you to start out by expressing gratitude for the gift of life. But now, I want to move a little closer. I would like for us to give thanks <laughs> for our own DNA, deoxyribonucleic acid, or 
the microchip of your genetic inheritance. And um, I just appreciate the invitation you gave me to talk about this because it led me back to one of my favorite passages of Scripture, made favorite, obviously, by Howard Thurman, who, when he came to Union Theological Seminary during my junior year in seminary, latter part of the 50s, he came and he was going to quote scripture before his talk. And I was sitting out in the audience. And he looked up like this. And he said, O oh God, thou hast searched me and known me. And as he continued, you know my sitting down and my rising up. It's not a word in my mouth, but lo, you know it all together. You have beset me before and behind. As a, uh, where can I go from your spirit and where can I flee from your presence? If I make my bed in Sheol, you are there. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, you are there. And he kept looking. And as he talked, I was so convinced that he was talking to somebody up there until I actually violated the protocols. I actually turned around in my seat to see who he was talking to. Well, he had such a keen sense of the presence of God. We say, although he's not American Baptist, he was a mystic out of the Quaker tradition, too. He seemed to have such a connection with God that he could have that conversation. So, I'm getting ready now to read Psalm 139. But I'm going to ask you to provide autobiographical content to this passage. It may not even be ever read again the same. I would like for you to listen to my text, but to hear it filling in the blank with, partic with particularity as it relates to your sexuality. Oh, how audacious. But think of yourself as a sexual being. Go all the way back to, to the beginning of the experience of being in your mother's arms. Go back to the awakening, to the sense of sensation in the body as either she nurses you or bathes you. Go back to the awakening of of strange and yet wonderful feelings alone or with others. Go back to the experience of a particular delight. The girl next door, the boy next door. Go back to the exploratory introduction to the wonderfulness of the body. Go back to... Your first kiss, the first touch, the f first petting, the, the first whatever. Did I go far enough to give some suggestion? <laughs> I don't, I don't, I don't, can, can I quit there, please? I don't have to go all the way to your bedroom door. To, to get, but but I, want, I want you, as I read this passage, to think of yourself as talking to God that Howard Thurman saw in regards to your sexual experience. 
In regards to my sexuality, O oh Lord, you have searched me and known me. You know when I sit down and when I rise up. You know my fantasies. You discern my thoughts from far away. And uh, it's been quite a journey, but you search out my path and pardon the expression, and my lying down. As a matter of fact, God, you are acquainted with all my ways. And even before a, tongue is, a word is on my tongue, you know it completely. In other words, I'm an open book to you. You know what I've been through. You hem me in behind and before, and, and yet you... Lay your hands on me. <laughs> Somebody who knows me that intimately. It's wonderful. Such knowledge is, in fact, it's too wonderful for me. It's, it's so high. I can't, it's, that, that there's somebody who knows everything about me. The first signal of my brain in relationship to my body my body parts even. You know all there is about me. In fact, I try to fit within the strictures set forth by my church, my culture, my family, my neighborhood. But I can't seem to get away from your spirit. Where can I go from your spirit? Or where can I flee from your presence? sexual being that I am, if I ascend to heaven, you're there. If I make my bed in Sheol, you're there. If I take the wings of the morning, dwell and settle at the farthest limits of the sea, you're there. Your right hand, even there, your hand is trying to, trying to, you, you take my hand and you lead me and your right hand, no matter where, no matter where, no, no matter where I go, your right hand holds me. Whether I'm in the light or whether I'm in the dark, whether folk know about it or whether they don't know about it. If I say, surely the darkness shall cover me and the light around me becomes night, even the darkness is not dark to you what I do in the day, or what folks know about, what they don't know about. The night is as bright as the day, for darkness is as light to you. And speaking of my sexuality, it was you who formed my inward parts. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your words. This contraption, this brain, circulatory system, nervous system, these organs, just wonderful. In fact, in fact, I pause for station identification. When I got to thinking about what the psalmist was saying, that's where I got the idea that God, in the process of our development, was actually party to the preparation of our DNA. Because when he says, my unformed substance, you took it when it was only an, in, an embryonic hint of what my eventual stuff would be, even though in continuance it had not yet been done, but you kind of know, God was all up in that. So when I get to thinking about Jim Forbes and who I am as a biological creature, as a sexual creature, I, I just want to think that that part of it is, is just what God has done, has given me. Oh, I've been messed up by a lot of religious dogma about what ought to be done and what ought not to be done. But fundamentally, when I got real religion, I was able to be grateful for my DNA. And that's a major thing. One of the gifts of the church ought to offer people, no matter what their orientation is, is the church ought to finally be able to say, thank you for our DNA. 
In fact, I wrote it like this. I may not be exhibit A of what a saint is supposed to be. I may not know the finer points of the latest theology. I may not be a paragon of Christian humility. And every now and then, it's an awful sin how I stoop to hypocrisy. Dear Lord, I hope you hear my prayer. I confess my iniquity. Then let me say how proud I am of my wonderful destiny. I celebrate what you create. I affirm all I'm meant to be. Thank you, God, for the gift of life in the form of a person like me. Thank you for my DNA. Yes, thank you for my DNA. It took an artist divine to make this design and fashion it all the way. Thank you for my DNA. Yes, thank you for my DNA. You gave the design. Now I'm making it mine. Thank you for my <laughs> DNA. Well, anyway, the idea is uh, yeah, thank you. Thank you for my for my rambunctious self. Thank you. There. Right, right. Anyway, but let, let's go back to the text here. Um, oh, how weighty these ideas. Your eyes saw my unformed substance. I'm grateful. When I come to the end, I'm still with you. But then there's some mean folks who've, 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 who've had a torturous, yea, even murderous impact on my sense of self-acceptance. Some of them were religious. And this ought not to even be in the Bible. This is the part we ought to have cut out. But the psalmist was more honest than most religious people. Oh, that you would kill the wicked, oh God. Kill them. And that the bloodthirsty would depart from me. Those who speak of you maliciously and, and lift themselves up against you for evil. Do I not hate those who hate you, O Lord? And do I not loathe those who rise up against you? I hate them with perfect hatred. I count them my enemies. Which is to suggest that it is difficult to grow up or to have reached psychosexual maturity without hating some folks who tampered with your unfolding into who you are, whether in a benign or a malicious way. And the Lord forgives you that. You have exercise. I'm not Roman Catholic, but I grant you absolution <laughs> and pardon for feeling bad about folks that messed over you, including yourself, because your reaction to the reaction of others is an action. And sometimes we are not our own, our own best friends. But the thing that called me to read this whole psalm was at the end where it says, and I ask you to repeat these words after me, search me, O God, me, o God. and know my heart. And know my heart. Test, me Test me and know my thoughts. Know my thoughts. See if there is any wicked way in me And lead, me and lead me in the way everlasting. The way everlasting. Eric, only yeah. just this year did I notice that the margin down here, there's a letter, and Wicked is a very, there's a play on Broadway called Wicked. Anybody seen Wicked? <laughs> what does Wicked mean? After having read about how God shaped me to be who I am. The word wicked down here in the margin, it says the Hebrew probably means hurtful. And I got to thinking that one of the mean meanings of wicked is anything which hurts the givenness of grace in God's creation of who we are. That's wicked. And then I have to ask, have I ever done stuff that messed over God's creation of who I am? Or have I ever been in a community? If I did it, it was wicked. If I tried to lie about who I was in order to conform to what somebody else thought I ought to be or do, that's wicked. If 
if somebody else tried to shove my humanity into a form that was prescribed even by biblical text interpreted, but tried to take my stuff of being that God had granted and shove it down into a more conventional, acceptable dynamic, that's wicked. And a culture that separates us between this one that God made is acceptable, this one that God didn't make is not acceptable, the way God made her is acceptable, the way God made him is not acceptable, the way God made you is acceptable, the way God made Cultures that do that stuff may also deserve that description for wicked. But notice, after having expressed hatred for those who are enemies of God and of us, it comes down to a decision that everybody has to make. I ask you to read these words after me, but that was just to get this message moving. Suppose God does search us and test us. And suppose God finds something that might be considered wicked, the violation of the gift that God has given. Do you notice that the psalmist says, if you find anything where I've distorted the genuineness of who you made me to be, I put those words in. Lead me in the way of everlasting. That means the psalmist is asking that if you find anything wicked, do you have grace enough for me to meet me where I am and then lead me where I'm called to be? Let me make a caveat here. The therapies that people are proposing by which they're going to take somebody and make them something other than God made them to be, they're kind of wicked. But no matter what, do you want a God who, if God finds in us anything that is a denial of the gift of God into who we are, do you want a God that's merciful and has grace to work with us and leads us into the, the ancient way, the good way? I'll tell you for me. I am so glad that God is merciful that I understand how important it was when Jesus says, blessed are the merciful. Why? For they shall obtain mercy. If I, and I'm, I'm, I'm speaking worldwide, right? You mean if I go to Australia, they know that I'm saying this? Could y'all cut the camera off? No, y'all don't. <laughs> I would like for every culture to decide as they deal with something as primary as the gift of sexuality which God has given folks that they would do all they could in the laws and the rules and the regulations and the ordinances not to pervert the gift of God by trying to shove everybody into the convenient configuration that the culture has come to. And if any reason that to continue to have the debate that what we would have to do is say, God, while we wrangle our way through to clarity about what we ought to believe, will you be a merciful God for those who are open and also for those who are closed? Because the open ones are probably closed about something. <laughs> <laughs> Give me mercy. Lord have mercy, Lord have mercy, Lord have mercy, mercy on me. 
Now, I'm going back to my notes so I can start my speech, okay? <laughs> I gave a topic that I was going to talk to you on the golden rule solution. And uh, that's what I want to talk about now, the golden rule solution. By the way, if God loves you, no matter who you are, the gay folks in here and the straight ones, if you close off, to use Pauline language, the bowels of compassion towards others, what you do is you constrict. What happens, if God's love flows to you, it always wants to flow through you. But if it gets to you, you with your straight self, and you close it down, then it starts receding the other way, and you don't get the full benefit of the flow of God's love to you. You can't close off your loving respect for others and expect to enjoy God's fullness of grace. In fact, I wrote a little poem about that. See what you think about this poem. How can you hate my other children and still expect to enjoy my grace? Do you think I'll love you any less if I share my love in a different place? I love Jews, Christians, and Muslims too. There's enough of me to love you all. If such love is a problem for you, you must have had a terrible fall. Never claim to hate in my name. Zeal that kills wins no prize. Show me some love by finding a way to see all my children through my eyes. Does that feel like? But I want to, I want to, tonight I want to speak to you from the topic, uh, the golden rule solution. Um, Matthew chapter 7, verse 7, verse 12 says the following, in Matthew chapter 7, Verse 12 says, In everything, do to others as you would have them do to you. For this is the law and the prophets. What a statement. This text, when I was the pastor at the Riverside Church, we had the Dalai Lama lead a host of religious leaders from at least a dozen different faith traditions from around the world. And they all came together to read, standing in the chancel, the version of this golden rule as it is found in their tradition. And all of them had this verse as a central uh, foundation stone of right relationships between people. The golden rule. However, I grew up in a fundamentalist church. I was Pentecostal by background. I still think I got Pentecostal spirit inside of me. But I never liked people that did proof texting, that just read one verse, because they could get it out of context. They, they, could, uh, they could stigmatize whole groups of people just by one verse out of a context. So when I say we need a golden rule a solution to the problem of our wrangling about sexual inclusiveness of people, gay, lesbian, bisexual, transgendered, queer, or even to talk about marriage equality, or even to talk about first-class citizens and second-class citizens. Uh, I have to read the whole chapter to think I have zeroed in on what that verse 12 means. So I'm not going to read it. I'm going to tell you, I'm going to give you the fruit of my research on that, that chapter. To be faithful to the golden rule requires you to start at verse 1. Verse 1 says, do not judge so that you may not be judged. So 
I'm, and I'm, I'm not going to give you expert uh, uh, exegesis on everybody, on every one of these, but I just I want you to be able to recognize that if you're going to go for the golden rule, you're going for more than verse 12. You're going for the context that makes verse 12 a deeper, a richer, a more comprehensive mandate. Do not judge, because if you be of judgmental, it doesn't, it, it really does not mean you can't have a judgment about this. It's right, basically about a judgmental spirit. If you've got a judgmental spirit, that's an abomination in the sight of God, because of the boomerang effect of judging. And it's based on the principle of reciprocity. The same judgment you're going to judge other folks with is the same judgment with which you will be judged. So it says, don't judge. Verse 2, there's an if-then connection. It says, not only if you, if you judge folks, you're going to be judged too. If you have a judgmental spirit about other folks, different from you, you're going to be judged too. Heaven's going to judge you just like you're judging them. I'm talking about, uh, this is the Bible. I'm reading from the Revised Standard Version. Also, you're giving that uh, the same measure you give, the same you're going to get. If you withhold charity of spirit from others, you're not going to get much charity yourself. It's kind of a kind of prudential ethic we're working with here, but that's okay. Uh, verse, listen, verses 3 and 4, I like those verses too. Because they say, why do you see the speck in your neighbor's eye but do not notice the log in your own eye? A whole lot of this talk about sexuality is about folks wanting to take the log out of somebody, I mean a speck out of somebody else's eye, and they got a log in, in their eye. Self-criticality qualifies one to offer advice to another. You hear that? If you can't criticize yourself, then will you please be quiet when it comes to <laughs> assessing the moral standing of other people, please? Hypocrisy claims a level of moral concern. I'm so concerned about you, brother. But you're unwilling to apply that concern to yourself, except only in the particular that you find inconvenient. I'm just going to read this down, and then I'm going to read. I'm watching my clock because I want to sort of get out in time. Do not offer your pearls before swine. They might turn and rend them. Be careful. If you think you've got something that's really holy, please have respect for the humanity of the person you're trying to give the holiness to. Because if you're talking to them like they're a dog, clearly you don't even value the advice yourself. You don't cast your pearls before swine even. So if you really care enough, love enough to somebody to tell them about how you want them to behave, you must at least recognize them as human agents that may have an opinion about what you're saying as well. Don't, don't give quality human advice to dogs or swine. If that person is beneath the standard of humanity, then you've already made a dog or a swine out of them. But be careful about trying to legislate for folks that you don't consider real folks acceptable unto God. Okay, we know we need blessings from God, and our reaching out to God should ba be based on our understanding of who God is. In these verses from 7 to 12, God seeks to describe God's own self-understanding of who God is. God speaks about, ask and it will be given, seek and you shall find, that's from King James, Knock and the door will be open to you, and so forth. For everyone who asks receives, everyone who searches finds, and for everyone who knocks, the door will be open. And then God makes a theological statement about God's own self. He said, now you regular folks, you all know you all don't quite qualify with the quality of love that I have. If you who are evil, one text says, others say, you who are merely human, if you have the kind of natural responsiveness to your children, then what do you think about the nature of my response to my children? And he says, 
Is there anyone among you, if your child asks for bread, will give them a stone? Or if the child asks for fish, will give a snake? If you then who are evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your heavenly father? So Jesus is saying, God is describing God's self as I am a good God and I pay attention to your needs. Even when I make laws, I'm sensitive to your needs. Ah. After that, we come to the golden rule. But I'm going to go past that. Because in verse 13, it says, it's a narrow gate that we're talking about. No matter whether you're on the left or the right of this issue, sexuality is a hard one. Because it has so much variation about it. It has to do with the complication that it is very private, exceedingly intimate. And yet, it is impacted by public and social boundaries as well. So it's a difficult thing. Listen, if you, like me, I only went as far as analytical geometry in college. I never took calculus. To try to regulate sexuality requires calculus. Let me just read some more here. Um, folks, it's by your deeds that you will be known. Good tree can't bring forth bad fruit. Bad tree can't bring forth good fruit. Reinhold Niebuhr says, most of us defy that bit of scripture. Because if any good comes from us, it probably also comes from a source that's capable of giving bad stuff too. The good life is built upon the foundation of what God wills. And for people that are gay, you really have to finally decide that you're going to keep studying like I did. I had a real problem. Let me tell you my big problem. My problem wasn't about sexuality. It was about my spirituality. Because in my Pentecostal tradition, they did not believe that you had the Holy Spirit unless you spoke in tongues. And I happen to be one of those weird dudes who always tended to put his mind in gear before he put his mouth in motion. And so I did found it difficult to speak in tongues. So many people, even as I got to be a pastor, never, they had never heard me speak in tongues. So they didn't believe that I had the Holy Spirit. Can you imagine what it's like to be a Pentecostal pastor in a Pentecostal church and they don't even think you got the basic foundation of the faith that they are proposing? It was so hard for me that I became pretty much <clears throat> a pneumatologist. I read everything I could read about the spirit. And what I understand now about spirit is based on partly self-defense. If you're gay, a lesbian, bisexual, or transgender, read all you can to figure out what is God's attitude about it? Because the church does not always represent God's attitude. <laughs> God says, or at least the God that Jesus talks about, is sensitive to our needs, responsive to our requests, is very generous and a thoughtful parent, and also knows how to give good gifts to the children, to those who ask. That's as far as I want to go in that, and I kind of want to begin to uh, shape up what I want to be talking to you about tonight. This is the section of my talk that is a personal interview. You didn't think I was going to lecture without giving a test, did you? <laughs> the first question I want to ask each of you, you up there. Have you ever grown into a more mature understanding of anything that's foundational to life? That's OK. I mean, have you always felt, believed exactly what you believe now? Or have you grown into a more mature understanding of things that have to do with life itself?
I'm asking people around the world, if what you believe and fight and fuss and kick and scream about today, is it the same perspective you always had or have you managed to grow some? And that you have a broader understanding now? Or maybe I should be fair, a more constricted understanding. Doesn't that you can grow one way or the other? Second question. If Jesus could grow, is it all right? What's your name? Mm -hmm. If Jesus, says Luke 252, increased in wisdom and knowledge and in favor with God and humankind, is it all right for Karen to grow? Or does she have to get locked in? This is what I always thought. I'll never think anything else. Or else I'll go to hell. No. If Jesus could grow, can she grow too? What did it mean that Jesus increased in wisdom? Was it his increase in regards to the meaning of the law? It has been said by those of old, but I say unto you, how did he make that leap? Well, before he made that leap, did it mean he was a sinful guy? Or was growth a part of his representation? Is it even a manifestation of the incarnation? That part of growing in the human context is to be cocksure that this is it and yet find some question as to whether this fully captures the essence of the divine intent. Cindy, there was a woman who asked him for a blessing and he said, look, it is not right to give the children meat to the dogs. Did Jesus grow when that woman says, yes, but even the dogs can find the crumbs that fall from the table? And then he says, your daughter as well. Was that a growing moment? Had he moved from the particularity of, of attitudes towards foreigners? Did he grow? Well, what was, was he a sinner before he came to this perspective? Or is that an appropriate way to talk about that? Ma'am, if you think you're going to follow Jesus, be careful because Jesus is funny. Jesus, you know Hugh Hefner is related to the, Hugh, you know Hugh Hefner? Not personally. Not personally. <laughs> But, I am aware of but, 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 but people that we might consider to be well into the lust dynamic, do you know that it was Jesus who said, Jimmy Carter, if you've looked at a woman to lust after her, you are seen on the same continuum of those whose open posture is completely without the normal regulations that we apply. It was Jesus. Well, what I'm saying is that captured the essence of what you, you've looked at a woman, to, you've committed adultery. Yeah, but if you lusted the way God looks at stuff, <laughs> the same kind of thing. One has just the seed, but the other has sprouted into a full grown plant. And God is usually more interested in the seed because ultimately the deed is reflected in the seed. By the way, suppose our concept of God restricted the freedom of God. And in some sociological sense it does. That what we believe about God actually restricts what God can do. Even for Jesus, he went to a certain city they didn't believe in him, so he did not many mighty works. God would wonder, and I'm asking this on behalf of God, I think. Though you believe one thing, wherever you are, what side you come off of, would you be prepared to let God grow? Oh, I think that's a thunderous question. 
Is it all right if God grows beyond the God you thought you read about in Genesis or Leviticus or Romans? God says, folks, you got me into a narrower box and your zealotry is trying to fulfill my will. But guess what? Y'all come. Y'all can. We're not a couple. No, no. <laughs> <laughs> we just met that, tonight. That work. <laughs> <laughs> no, it wouldn't work. <laughs> hey, hey, this is a productive session. <laughs> I need a couple. I got a couple. Here's a couple. Here's a couple. I got no couples over there. Y'all, y'all a couple? <laughs> have you all seen? Have you all seen Hope Springs? You haven't seen Hope Springs? Tommy Lee Jones and Meryl Streep. You need to see it because in it, what happens is she, Meryl Streep, finds that there's a marriage encounter week in Maine. And their relationship hadn't been going well. When they go up the steps, she goes to the right, he goes to the left. It's just a perfunctory relationship. It's a loss of all of its dynamism. And she decides we need to go. He doesn't want to go because he doesn't want to be talking about his business before people he doesn't, want, doesn't know. Do you know in the movie, and I'm not going to spoil it for you, they discover that while they were living together, they really did not truly know each other. But from a ministerial point of view, I think that's God. That we in America think of ourselves as a godly nation. And God says, we got to go to counseling. <laughs> you, 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 don't, you, you, you don't know me. You have your prejudice which you put into my mouth. I love all my children and I want to know, can, is it all right with you if I love my other children that are different from you? So I think America needs marriage counseling. And we might discover some interesting things about God. God might be more fun than you think God is. <laughs> well, I'm the last question, but if I had time, I would ask you, you uncomfortable being that inclusive? Question, is comfort more important than conformity to the will of God for you? In fact, why don't I acknowledge public here? When I was in Riverside the first year, coming out of my evangelical background, first year I went to the Gay Pride Parade. I, you know, I'm leading the delegation. Y'all, I wasn't comfortable. <laughs> <laughs> but persistence in conformity can alter the comfort index. Just because you're not comfortable with it, I ain't, you know, I ain't comfortable with that. Well, comfort is not the highest premium in the kingdom of God. And finally, not only will you let God be God, but God wants somebody that God can use because for every person who has been denied humanity on account of projecting values onto God that restricted God's capacity to love them, God is trying to do some repair work and wants to know, listen, folks, God wants to know, could I use you to help restore a sense of belonging to those who have been despised and rejected? And by the way, if you decide that you want to show love to people that are different from you, try not to organize and think that you're being generous when you provide specialized ways in which they're going to be accepted. Like, I ain't going to marry them, but I'm going to give them some unions. That's second-class acceptance. And God wants to know, can I use you to restore the sense of full acceptance of those who have been denied despised and rejected? And could I also use you to help build a culture where all God's children have a place in the choir, some sing lower 
and some sing higher. I think that's about all I need to say. How would I want to close this message about the golden rule? Maybe the best way to close it is to say a prayer. Lord, I have gone through the process of being homophobic and afraid. And even now, I'm trying to grow to understand the issues of gay, lesbian, bisexual, transgender persons. But let me so receive your love that I would be ready to be used of you to be on the growing edge of becoming that kind of community that Christ died for and that kind of community that the Spirit is trying to build up. And thank you for this weekend opportunity here at Countryside. May I be a more profitable servant to the realm of God because of at least wrestling with the issues. And Lord, I am willing to be with St. Paul who recognized that he was not perfect, but you said that your grace was sufficient for him. Remind each one of us that neither of us is going to make it to heaven unless you are grading on the curve. <laughs> and grant to us the willingness to be apostles of mercy and understanding. And help us to know that if we are worried about protecting your sense of outrage, that you can do a pretty good job <laughs> by yourself. And that perhaps our greatest gift to you is to let you be even the God revealed to us in Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Thank you everyone for coming and, and sharing the humorous moments and the, the wisdom and the new knowledge that we all have. I would like to ask Dr. Forbes and Eric Elton to go ahead and walk out first so that they can be out there and greet you as you all leave and it will be a chance to uh, greet him in person. So if you would just wait till they exit. Thank you all for coming tonight. I'll get my water.